Hello everyone and welcome to this much awaited video. Well, maybe more awaited by me than by you, but I have excellent news. In case you're new here, some time ago, I started my own version of the breathe dress. A beautifully decorated silver gown, Renaissance-inspired, Renaissance uh, worn by Drew Barrymore as she played Danielle de Barbarak in the 1998 film Ever After. If you're not familiar with the film, it's kind of a retelling of Cinderella. Um, if you want to find out a little bit more about the costumes, I've got two different videos on the channel about that. I'll link them down below. Uh, and I've also got a part one for this project, uh, which was... I think filmed in 2021, which you may notice was two years ago. But I technically actually started this project in February 2019. Yes, you heard that right. 2019. <clears throat> this project took four years. Four, four years to complete. I don't know what to tell you. It's absolutely my most long-term project to date, probably ever. I don't think I'll ever commit to something like this ever again. But it is finally, finally done. <laughs> if you want a little bit more background on the project, I recommend those other videos I mentioned. I'll link them down below. Uh, the first video goes into a bit more about the design, the details, all the materials I bought because this has a lot of materials. Um, and I won't be covering those in this because it's just, <laughs> that other video is 45 minutes. It's just 45 minutes of me showing you like different trims and like starting on the embroidery and yeah There's a lot of good info in there though. So do go watch it But I will give you a quick recap in case you don't want to sit through that. So this dress that I'm talking about Is commonly called the breathe dress and that's because it comes at a part in the film where it's like her big revelation Transformation dress and um, where she comes to the big ball to tell the prince the truth I'm not going to give you any more film spoilers, but it's a Cinderella kind of thing. So this is her Cinderella dress. And um, in the film, it has a lot of emotional value because it belonged to her mum, who isn't around. Um, and yeah, so it's a beautifully, beautifully decorated silver dress with loads of trims, loads of like little embroidery details. Um, it's just stunning. And it has a Renaissance inspired, you know, that sort of Italian Renaissance kind of vibe. It's not Again, this is not my, exactly my time period either, but there's a little bit more about that in the other two videos. If you want a little bit more information on the historical side, there's a video I did with Marty from Scrappy Patterns and I'll link that one down below as well. But basically this dress is loosely inspired in Italian Renaissance with some clear fantasy vibes. When I first did the research for this dress, do keep in mind it was four years ago, I found a version of uh, our ever favorite costumes guide, costumer's guide, uh, com. I'll link that up down below. There's a, a breathed, well not a breathed dress, an ever after version of that website which has loads of information from all different kinds of costumes from the film including the breathed dress and it includes really high quality photographs from people who saw it on display in exhibitions in America and it also has like little sketch and diagrams of people's own studies on it and links to someone other who, other recreations. I did draw my own conclusions about how some things were done and also compromised on some aspects so it could flatter my figure a little bit more because I'm obviously very very different from Drew Barrymore in 1998 and um, also to compromise on materials because I didn't have uh, access to the same materials obviously. <laughs> so overall this dress has a fitted bodice with sort of an A-line skirt in a silver crepe back satin with puffy and fitted sleeves in a crinkle silver fabric and netting. And then it also has a skirt overlay that's heavily decorated. The dress itself overall is heavily, heavily decorated with all different kinds of trims, embroidery, beading, all kinds. I avoided while I was making this costume to do like individual clips because obviously I've got some where I talked because I've got some clips that are from like four years ago and it didn't really make any sense anymore. So I thought I'd sit down and talk you through it and show you how I made it because I think that's what we're all here for. It was a big project and I'm really happy to share how I tackled it because maybe you'll make your own, you know? That'd be really cool. We all wear our little breathe dresses and have those amazing moments. So instead of going chronologically because this dress was not made in order, in a realistic order, um, I'll, I'll 
present the dress to you from inside out. For this dress, I started by draping the bodice. I had already done this, so in the previous video, I actually had a draped and partially built bodice and skirt that got scrapped because I didn't like them anymore. They didn't fit me anymore. I've grown a lot over these past four years in my sewing skills as well, so they weren't really up to scratch. So instead I started from, from zero and I draped it. And I remember from draping the first one that if you drape it with the cutout, so there's like a V cutout with like trims underneath, if you drape it with that, it's much harder to fit because the bias will stretch weirdly and then when you cut it out, it won't stretch the same way. It's like a whole a whole thing. So instead, I, this time I draped it with the neckline being the, with the cutout version, the cutout bit. Okay, so we're ready for the first mock-up. I've just finished it. Uh, I just wanted to make a note that it's important to try on your mock-ups with wherever you are going to be wearing underneath. In this case, I've decided to go for my Regency stays. I know that in the film, um, there's some some uh, like behind-the-scenes knowledge that there was a specific corset made for that dress, and it's more like an understructure, and it looks more like an 1840s, 1830s kind of corset. It's quite long line, or maybe even a Regency, but long line. Um, I don't have one of those and I don't want to make another one and I think this will give me the silhouette I want with enough support um, I'm not sure about the wings. I decided I'll figure out if I, if I ever do make them <laughs> So this is what we're going with and now we're just going to try it on Okay, so here we are. Um, I wasn't very confident in this bodice for a couple of reasons so in the dress <laughs> when she wears it in the film the sleeves are way pulled down so that it hangs like off the shoulder like this. But when you see it in exhibitions, the sleeves actually sit up in their normal position. I drafted it to be off the shoulder, but I didn't want to draft, I wanted to draft it that way to make sure that the sleeves weren't too tight or too large to be worn over the shoulder. So I think this actually might just need to be taken in a slight bit, but not too much according to the sleeves. Um, now, as you can see, it is way too big in the front. So I did some alterations where I took away a bust dart um, to shape here. And so I took it away, but then I had to add to the waist for it. And I think I just added way too much, as you can see. So I'm gonna pin away some of this excess, uh, transfer it to the pattern, and then just simply put the pattern piece, the new pattern pieces over these, over this, cut accordingly, and try it on again. Predictably, I did not film the second mock-up. <laughs> or maybe I did, and I've lost the footage. I found I've lost a bunch of footage and I have no idea where it's gone. But what did you expect when you've got a project that spans four years? But the second mock-up turned out all right, and once I was confident it wouldn't need any more adjustments, I cut out three layers. So it's cut out of the silver crepe back satin, one layer of plain cotton, in this case grey cotton to match because why not? And then one layer of silk organza in silver as well. The purpose of the cotton is to interline the crepe back satin because I thought it would give it a bit more stability. The pieces were layered over each other into like a delicious fabric sandwich and then they were basted along the edges to make them into one and from then on they're treated as one piece of fabric and that's what interlining is. It's a very useful skill and I use it all the time. And it was now time to bring out my overlocker. I don't use this very much because to be honest, I'm still scared of it. I bought this a few years ago off eBay for like 30 quid. It was, it's, it's pretty old, but it, it works. So when, you get, you can, when you can get it to work, it works. The problem is I often can't get it to work. <laughs> and in fact, for this, the only way I could get it to work was by doing a rolled hem. So I finished all the edges with a rolled hem. I don't, I couldn't get the tension to work otherwise, but here we are. But I only had a month or so to finish this dress before the convention, I wanted to wear it too. And the overlocker is a really quick way to finish your seams nicely and speedily. So I had no qualms in using it. I cut away the V-section of the bodice, turned under those raw edges and then pinned it back into place. So once I've cut out the V-section, I added some of the trims to it. The first one is like this really beautiful vintage metallic lace. I actually mentioned a different type of lace in the previous video, but I really wasn't happy with that. And I found these scraps at a vintage fair for like eight quid, so I bought them. <laughs> and they're just layered nicely on top of that V-section as nicely as I can, and then hand basted into place. This was easier to do while the front was still flat, which is why none of the side seams are sewn. So I just sewed the V-section into place, and then I could tackle the side seams. So 
I've just turned on the bodice because it's finally for the first time able to be tried on and this is pretty much as far as I got with the previous version of this dress, the previous bodice and skirt combo. It's too tight and this is why I really want to reinforce that it's so important to try on the clothes you make while you're making them. I never used to do this, um, whenever I started sewing I just kind of wanted to get through the whole process, get it over and done with and then try on the final thing. It's so important to try on as you go. I ended up having a lot of ill-fitting things that I couldn't be bothered to fix. So it's too tight, particularly across the chest area. I have a couple of options, which is what I'm going to try. Um, I don't have very wide seam allowances, I have about half an inch. But what I'm going to do is going to let it out under the arm until about halfway down the side seam. And I'm going to uh, use, I'm going to try and let out some of the curved back seam at the back. I'm not sure that will make a huge difference, but I'm going to try to do it across the top. So the thing about adding a little bit more room to garments that are just a little bit tight, not too much, but like just, just too tight, is to add, it's not about adding a lot, it's about adding where it needs it. So for example, mine is particularly in the chest area, so I need to make sure that I'm only adding room in the chest area, which is why I'm not going to, um, I'm, not the, I'm not going to give extra room in the whole seam allowance of the sidearm, just the top end, because the waist is actually just fine. So that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to try those, to fiddle with those four seams, um, and then, if it doesn't work, I'm going to try and give it a little bit more room in the half an inch seam allowance at the centre back. I usually do this first, but I didn't want to mess with it because it's only half an inch, half an inch and I need it to support the tiny little eyelets I'm going to have to sew to close this dress. So that's what we're going to try. And then if it comes down to the fact that those two things don't work, there is one more desperate thing that I can try, which is to undo the underarm side seam here and add a little triangular gusset. I actually think that might be easier than fiddling with all the seams, so I might just do that. It's under the arm, it probably won't be very noticeable, and I think it would just give me the most room without... Yeah, I'm not going to fiddle with the back seams, I'm just going to do that in the underarm. I'm just going to add a little triangle. It's going to be the easiest, and it's going to work the best, I think. And yes, it's not accurate to the dress. It's going to fit me! <laughs> So, let's do some problem solving. I have this trend in my videos where I film the bit where I'm actually thinking through what I'm doing out loud. And usually by the end of the clip, whatever I've spent the first 45 seconds talking about has changed. But I keep these in because I think maybe it'll be helpful to, to show you that the sewing project isn't linear, it isn't clear cut, and you might be thinking of something and then 45 seconds later you decide to do something else. So I thought I'd just, I leave, the, I leave them in just for you. <laughs> the gusset under the arm is what I went with and it worked a treat. I just cut out this gusset out of the three layers of all the fabrics, interlined them, sewed it into place, and it added exactly the room I needed. And I don't think it looks too jarring because it's right under the arm and these big puffy sleeves, so I don't think it's too noticeable. And with that, the main portion of the bodice was complete. There's a lot of hand finishing to do, there's closures to add and million trims to add, but for now, this is it. This is the basic bodice. So we're moving on to the skirt. I also draped this shape and I learned from the first drape version that I did that I didn't add enough volume. It's a very plain A-line skirt, but I wanted a bit more swish. And that's because my body proportions are different to Drew Barrymore's and I find that a fuller hem flatters my figure a bit more. So I, de I definitely wanted to add that. So when I draped it, I draped it as a very simple like front panel cut on the fold. And then we would have two panels for the back, one on either side, and all of the flares on the side seams. And it just gives a nice swish when you turn around, but it still keeps that flat front. It kind of reminded me of, you know, those kersals that have like the triangular gussets at the side. It's almost like the pattern already has the triangular gussets built in rather than adding them later on. So I did kind of nice, I felt that it invoked still sort of an old timey kind of shape. These were cut out of the silver crepe back satin and also of the grey cotton interlined together into one. I pinned them together and then I overlocked the edges and this finished the raw edge and also basted them together. So you could do this by hand, you could do this by machine, but because these were such long pieces and I don't think the fabric would have bubbled or in a noticeable way, I just did it with the overlock all in one go and that saved me on time yet again. 
I had two seams to sew, which were the side seams, and then I started working on the hem. And that's because one of my absolute favorite features of this dress is actually this, uh, this underskirt padded hem. I just find it's genius and beautiful and like, I just, I love it. I love it. Look at it. I don't know. It just adds such a beautiful detail and I think it would add a really good weight to the skirt. I was really, really, this is one of the features I really wanted to keep. You can only really glimpse it through the parting of the overskirt at the front, but I, I, I really wanted to do it. So let's unpack this hem a little bit. There's at some point, there's a photo of it where there's a diagonal seam going across the hem. I have no idea what that's about. I didn't do that for mine because my, I think my skirt might be cut slightly different to theirs. But for the way I decided to do it was I cut a facing for the hem out of the gray cotton. And this is just one long rectangle. If you wanted this to be extra nice, you could cut it on the bias so that it curves nicely. I didn't do it because I didn't have enough fabric. So I just cut one long rectangular strip, um, the length of my hem. And then I pinned this to the hem, right sides facing each other. Um, but I made sure to mark my stitching lines on the facing and on the skirt where the hem would be. So keep in mind that this stitching line is where your hem will be. So make sure that's level. I did that and sewed it by machine. I then trimmed it so it's really short and then I pressed the facing towards the inside and it gives you a really nice, gives you a really nice hem. Once that was done, I stuffed padding. I cut out strips of, of batting, in this case, polyester batting, because it's what I got, what I had. And I actually split the batting in, in half because I thought it was too thick. You can do that with some battings. You can actually peel it so that it's two layers. And then that way I could use one of the scraps I had and didn't have to buy anymore. So there's that. And so I then stuffed it into the hem between the facing and the actual skirt. And then, and you could hand sew the facing down. I turned the raw edges under and you could, you could do that. But because there's going to be tiny French knots securing those, all those layers together anyway, I just used one of those hem tapes, which is sticky on both sides. First, I did a test to make sure that it didn't come through to the crepe back satin and it didn't. Um, and then I just used my iron to set that into place. It's almost like a temporary basting, but it was so much quicker than sewing it by hand. And I was already gonna spend hours and hours doing all these hand French knots. I might as well save time where I could. And it worked a treat. I sort of guesstimated the spacing for the French knots from the photos that I had, and then I started marking them along the hem with my ruler. And I didn't realize that this was gonna take forever because there's five rows of French knots and they're all kind of offset, almost like bricking. So instead what I did was I cut a little strip of cardboard and I made a little template that was evenly spaced so that all I needed to do was line up two of those dots and then I could mark the rest accordingly. So that was a way to save time. I marked all of them. I didn't count them, but there's hundreds and hundreds. And then it was time to do hundreds and hundreds of French knots. For this, I used DMC six strand cotton embroidery floss in just the matching gray. And I just sat down and I watched Hunger Games 1 and 2 and did this all by hand. I actually really enjoyed this process. I like hand sewing, I like embroidery, and this is the kind of like little therapeutic, repetitive hand sewn detail that I really, really like to do. So I had a great time. And with that, the base of the dress is complete. Well, I did actually do the back seam up as well, making sure that was finished. And then there's a slit at the back so you can get the dress on and off. But that is basically it. At this point, the bodice and the skirt are still separate. And that's because I wanted to attach the overskirt to the skirt before joining to the bodice so that it's all done in one go. So for that, you're gonna have to come to part two slash three of this project, uh, which will be out soon, I'm sure. I don't have a like footage of what this looked at this time because they were just separate bits that didn't really stand alone. 
Um, so instead, I'm going to give you a sneak peek of the full dress, because why not? Uh, there's a little bit more of bits I did and a sneak peek of the dress on my Instagram if you want to check it out over there. And eventually I will be putting this pattern on my Patreon. So if you want to see the pattern, head over there. That'll include all the embroidery bits as well, because I have all of those, so I might as well share them. So come back for the next uh, installment in this series where we'll tackle the sleeves, the overskirt, all the 600 decorations and trims and well, I think must be dozens and dozens of hand sewing hours at this point, but I didn't count them because I think that would drive me insane. So I'll see you very soon.